Hello and welcome to the CBMM and Partners Mobility Leadership Debate. The mobility sector is undergoing a radical change and transformation. All the automotive product makers and mobility service providers are responding to heightened challenges, new demands, new technologies and new players in the marketplace. Increasing electrification, the development and introduction of autonomous driving and AI and the drive for sustainable technologies are all increasingly important drivers of that change. In this changing landscape, innovation and new partnerships are key to meeting future needs and building sustainable businesses within this dynamic and exciting mobility sector. Today I'm joined by a number of recognised leaders in driving and responding to these changes and we are going to discuss battery and energy innovation. And so to start with, given this global drive towards electrification, I'd like you all to, to give me your single biggest energy challenge to deliver this, this radical change. Robson, mm -hmm. if we start with you. Yeah, in order to answer your question, Jack, I would like to put myself in the shoes of the final consumers because in the, in the, in the end of the day, what we're aiming with this technology is to massification and electrification of vehicles, especially for ev middle class. So, yeah, this business so far has been maintained in the last years or so with subsidies from the government. And if you look at the consumer base, for the electrical vehicles in these days is based on people with high income and also environmentalists, the first adopters, trendsetter. So in order to really, I think the biggest challenge is to drive the cost of the batteries in order to really, so in order to do this, of course, yeah, the battery chemistry is very, very important, especially we need an overall batteries with a much higher energy density in these days in order to make what we believe that yeah, reach the point that the electrical vehicles will be very competitive with combustion enter, engine yeah, vehicles. So, and this will be a blue sky for everybody and what we are dreaming for. Yeah. Jack, what's, what's going on? Well, I'd like to double down a little bit on what, what Robson said. I have that same feeling is that we really need to focus on the customers to grow the, accelerate yeah. the growth that we've had so far, really, really deliver what the customers want. And a couple areas that are key to me would be in terms of, for sure, driving range and rechargeability, how to, how to put a quick charge on your vehicle and make it like part of regular life. So I think uh, our collaboration in doing that is really the key to have the big growth. Okay. Roddy? Well, I would like also to add on this, uh, that it's not only a matter of cost, but it is also a point about the perception of cost. Yeah. Uh, since 2010 to today, the battery cost has been dropped down by 80%. So the technology, of course, is... Uh, uh, Growing is continuing, and um, uh, this is important. To uh, it is an important point to let the customer know, and also to educate the future consumer uh, around this point. I would like to add also the uh, life cycle assessment. So, for a matter of uh, uh, ethical reason, we have to make sure that um, from the source of chemical to the supply chain, the processes to produce things, uh, components, uh, they have to be. The old picture has to be uh, with the reduced emission in order to really make a change. Preston, what, what are your thoughts? So we're going to see tens of millions of new electric vehicles on the roads. Buses, trucks, delivery uh, vehicles, cars, etc. Utilities are definitely in a position to deliver that energy. The question is, what is the energy mix that fuels them? That is to say, is it clean uh, or is it coming from traditional generation sources mm -hmm. that also have carbon? The other component is uh, what is the cost of that energy? Is it going to happen at peak times where the utility has to procure uh, at high cost or is it going to happen at off-peak periods? To manage that, we need a variety of solutions on the digital technology front, including smart charging, but also flexibility in other management of on-site energy. And that challenge is what the opportunity also is to us to get more clean energy into the fuel cell mm -hmm. and into the fuel cycle, I should say, uh, but then also to make it at the right cost so that it doesn't get passed to consumers. Interesting. Uh, David? Yeah, I think it's interesting how uh, we've covered a number of issues of cost and range or, of course, some basic thresholds for you know, making this work. But, uh, but I think one of the areas that is going to be a critical challenge is the infrastructure technology. And I would expand that to include um, artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicle uh, software and, and middleware, connected vehicles, all the intelligence and big data that goes around that, privacy. All those types of issues are going to be interconnected with the true 
expansion to wide scale of electrified uh, vehicle network. And um, so the cost per kilowatt hour of the battery and the technology of that is kind of on a migration path that we see happening. We can predict that, we know it's happening. I think the, the bigger questions about the long term and the penetration and, and rate of adoption have to do with with these broader things that are harder technological questions that are maybe outside the battery space, but very, very important for basic users uh, like everybody to, to end up making the decision at the end of the day to purchase an electric vehicle rather than their, their um, internal combustion engine vehicle. Interesting, so on that, Jack, on that you know, kilowatt hours in a battery, we know where this is going. Can you give us a sort of idea of production battery volumes past and present and, and when, where you see that going? Sure, I mean, so maybe to make that rather complicated thing a little bit simple. So yeah. in the recent years, we could say the industry is producing 100, 200, most recently up to like 300 gigawatt hours of energy in batteries. These would be for, for EV vehicles. Yeah. And that's roughly proportional to the, still the low acceptance rate in the market. But if we, uh, if we look at the market in global, uh, in total globally, it's a 100 million unit market for passenger vehicles around the world. And if we took, say, a high end of that, say at 50% adoption, the, the resultant uh, electrification will, will grow by a factor of 10 or 20. It's really dramatic. It takes what's happened so far and really expands on it. In fact, we see that in my firm. We, uh, it's the main interest we have from our clients around the world is how to quicker grow electrification. So I would say substantial growth on the orders of 10, 20 times what we know today. Wow. Uh, Roddy, in, in the, as far as motorsport is concerned and, and the work being undertaken by McLaren to produce better batteries, could you, could you tell us a little bit about that and also what constitutes a, a better battery? Right, so I will identify three uh, layers of, uh, of a development, three general points. One is the chemical side of it, so deciding the state of the other of the technology. Then there is from the module to the battery, which is more a design kind of aspect. And then there is the electronics. That's how I see it. I mean, not in order of priority, mm. but these are the three pillars. So we have uh, partnered uh, uh, with an American company in order to uh, address the first point, the chemical side of it, and also the build and the testing and validation of the module. But then, as McLaren, we've been working, using our experience at, on the racetrack, on uh, um, the design of all the systems like cooling system in order to cope with a more aggressive duty cycle, which is basically the usage at, of the battery, which is much more stressed compared to a, a normal use. Um, so that's an important uh, point of, uh, of the validation. Uh, we have, always, all, of course, also been part of the mission profile definition, which uh, we had to model and simulate how a Formula e, a new Formula E car would have behaved on the same track uh, during the season. So that was the, the biggest challenge. Um, so again, going back to what makes the battery be better, I think the design phase is also something that can uh, definitely make a, a big difference. Last but not least, the electronics, which is the logging, the BMS side of it. Uh, there is still uh, a lot to do there in terms of how intellig intelligently manage the single cell or the modules in a battery package. Uh, this is uh, I mean, something that the artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques will definitely help. So we're talking largely about batteries in the vehicles. I also want to point out that batteries outside of the vehicles are massively important for the challenges that we have. Specifically, if you look at the optimizations, both in cost and also how they perform, if you can imagine a battery at this building potentially also combined with on-site solar mm -hmm. or other generation, that same battery, uh, either as a second life form after it's been in the vehicle or even up front, is something that's massively powerful with regards to how we can optimize the energy in this building. Pulling in power, uh, for instance, at night when there's a lot of wind or uh, available and low cost energy, and then using it during the day. So the platform, all the work that's being done to actually make batteries more cost effective has a lot of implications uh, for other usages outside or in addition to uh, what's happening with the vehicles themselves. And the other thing that we'll see over time uh, is also integrating those two things together, the battery in the vehicle plus the battery uh, in the, uh, at the site, specifically in a stationary setup. Lots of fun opportunity for all the technologies that you spoke about, David. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, if I'll just add to that, I mean, uh, what, absolutely, and, and uh, the, the actual uh, sort of, the actual mechanics of those integrations and those interfaces will take some time to evolve because each one requires business relationships and connections and, and, and contractual and pricing uh, prices uh, in some sort of a market. For example, it's easy to speak about a secondary market in batteries, but then um, as you look at the evolution of markets of all kinds in the financial instruments and the developing a market or a stock market in right. a, of a new commodity uh, takes sometimes takes years and years and and in sometimes uh, they you know people try to start markets that eventually don't have sufficient liquidity and they end up failing for example ETS is in Europe uh, in some regards but uh, so I think the actual mechanics of achieving what you're talking about with the integration with the solar PV on the roof and it will depend on uh, myriad questions like what time of day are you going to charge, which gets into what kind of demand charge uh, factors are going to be charged by the utility and what is the pricing of the energy storage from the utility to the vehicle. Maybe it's going to be different from the energy storage provider to the utility, to the homeowner than it is for, to, for the car charging. So all these kind of and that's connected with regulatory issues. So all these issues that you're describing are absolutely essential. And that's why I think they are going to take some time to, to work out. And if, as long as the United States goes about it on a state by state basis for the large part, that will um, kind of uh, make the, a, a very stochastic pattern of, of evolution. Just one more comment on that. That's absolutely correct. There's also actually very small transactions that can be done today mm -hmm. uh, that can be enabled between parties or directly at a given site. And I think the more we can bring it down to small transactions, even with blockchain technologies and sort of interactive uh, open market, if you will, we can actually do that innovation more quickly. We're already seeing that in certain microgrids and it's available today. Uh, and then you take these additional structures that you described that will come through regulatory and policy uh, and that accelerates it. But there's already a lot happening, and I'll speak maybe a little bit later about some examples that we're seeing on that front already today. Yeah, absolutely. Has, has, has there ever been anything like this before press, in terms of a precedent that has needed to combine such innovation and cooperation and integration and everything we're seeing here now? Or in the past, has everything been right? Let's build an aqueduct and get some water, and then job done. There's no integration there, you know. Well, I think, I think if I could step in here, I, sure. th I think your example of water with the aqueduct is good because if you extend that, all uh, you know, sort of asset-intensive businesses that have justification for centralized or regulatory kind of authority, energy, electric power, uh, water, gas, um, you know, transport, th they all have hubs, and usually, and uh, the, the evolution of them ends up in sort of one or multiple oligopolistic uh, anchor players who kind of dominate. And so what's going to be very interesting, the evolution of this industry, I think, is, is uh, which, which companies become the number one leader, the number two leader, and then what happens to numbers three, four, and five. Uh, and I think that's where companies have to think about their partnership strategies because if they get aligned with a number five player and that five player kind of uh, doesn't make the cut at some point, that might be a very long-term disaster strategy. Number one, it takes a lot of capital and scale and will require financing and maybe government support and all sorts of things. So there's a business model question around all of this, which is very important. If I may, Jack, yeah. I would like to, to add something that is very, very important. There's a lot of discussion also in order to really deploy all this possibility that's been discussed so far is the way that we design our cities. Maybe the future, the cities in the future, or remodeling cities around the world will be making a way you know, that we can yeah, be possible in infrastructure, share mobility, all kinds of things that will be much easier. So. Uh, and this is, is something that so far has been overlooked, but we need to also to give a hard thought in terms of how you design our cities, especially the cities of, of the futures. When it comes to electrification, IoT, things like this, yeah. Do you want to say something? Yeah, I was going to just add that smart cities, uh, I would yeah. call it smart cities, it, yes, it, yep. is, it encompasses a, a huge uh, opportunity. And uh, Boston Strategies just uh, sponsored a New York Energy Week a couple weeks ago. And in there we had uh, uh, 13 disrupting companies coming up in Smart Grid and presenting yep. their solutions. And it's absolutely uh, kind of awesome and mind-boggling the number and the magnitude of creative ideas there are for creating smart grids, microgrids, and optimizing the power distribution within a city. 
And then the power distribution is just the tip of the iceberg because, one, as you said, lifestyles change. And once you have, uh, if you change the vehicles from uh, driving vehicles yeah. to autonomous vehicles, then the, the rate of, of driving changes, which changes pedestrian zones, yeah. which changes storefronts, which changes uh, lifestyles. And, yeah. and suddenly the city, maybe in 20, 30 years, will look very, very different than uh, yeah, we're right. used to. Yeah, you imagine that we, in a seamless way that we don't have any problems of timing because you're not waiting for things like this. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. So cities need to be different, yeah, in the future. Robson, while we're with you, could you tell us about some of the technical development work that's going on at, uh, at CBMM? Um, yeah, what, what's going on to pr produce these better Yeah, batteries? we are in the very beginning of the value chain of the, the, of the battery business. We, we are raw material suppliers of Niobium, and Niobium so far, it's a very interesting element that people, it's being discovered in these days. Yeah, for batteries, it's a long, it's a recent, I would say in the last five or six years, we've been addressing very aggressively this market in order to really develop a uh, new battery materials chemistry containing niobium. We are very fortunate to find very good partners ar around the world. Yeah, we are addressing pretty much what is necessary in terms, in terms of making, yeah, I would say safer, yeah, more, yeah, high power, fast charging type of batteries and also energy density. And we are working with cathodes, anodes, but so far the most successful yeah, development that we've been doing is we, we've been partnered with some yeah, yeah, Japanese company, Toshiba, in, in order to develop a new, it's already in the prototype phase, yeah, a new anode material, which is capable of fast charging. So we are pilot plant now, yeah, the production in order to really yeah, start to test the market and the OEMs. And we will see because we, I, I, I believe we will be the first yeah, solution in terms of fast charging at a large scale that will be deployed in the market. So we believe that this could also change a little bit the mindset of the industry because there's a lot of thinking about our energy density, extending the driving range, but sometimes people forget about it. Okay, you can drive 600 miles, 800 miles of a vehicle, but you wait like three hours, four hours in order to, because the existing technology in these days, uh, you can supercharge, which is available in the market, but yeah, but the lifetime of a battery decreases quite a bit because the degradation, accelerated degradation. With this new technology, with niobium, with fast charging, yeah, we expect a more stable and also, yeah, yeah, the ability to to reduce the the charging of a vehicle in less than 10 minutes. So we are very excited. We are working hard in order to really deploy in the market to see how the market will respond. And of course, once you have this technology available, I think people are very creative to find other solutions or to use this solution to meet problems in other areas that we are, we know that exist, mm -hmm. not only in the electrical vehicles. So yeah, that's a, it, this is our game now. Fast charging is our, we are believing, yeah, we are working hard on this. Okay, interesting. Uh, Jack, we know that China is, is one of the, at the forefront of electrification and charging infrastructure, but where are the other key markets or market sectors that are going to be most profound and important? Right, so, I mean, in my company, in A2Mac1, we have an uh, operation in Shanghai, and that has uh, obviously shown the growth we've had in electrification. But in fact, I see it all around the world. We have uh, our head operation in France and an operation in the States, and the interest is universal. I would say uh, Europe uh, and the U.S. both right on the heels of that. In fact, obviously, they're state-of-the-art uh, electrified vehicles in the States right now. But um, the China, I think, remains the largest market. But the growth around the, the planet is immense everywhere, in fact. And Roddy, what is it that motorsport can do to, to help accelerate the innovation and, and performance improving? We were talking about the, the fast charging there. It, it, can that be helped by motorsport? Yeah, I was just uh, thinking uh, exactly about that point. Uh, well, for personally, motorsport and uh, innovation uh, uh, growth for me are the same, the same thing. It's really down to uh, the rules that the federations and promoters introduce in the sport that can definitely contribute to fix some aspects, not all, everything, but some aspect of the biggest challenge we have uh, in the industry of, of mobility in the future. One example is uh, uh, about uh, having to, I mean, since the introduction of hybrid and electric uh, uh, technology uh, in racing, we had to work uh, a lot on the power density aspects. If you think about a Formula One uh, car, of course, it's a different design, a different uh, 
uh, application, but in uh, one minute you can charge and discharge the battery mm. uh, during the lap. So um, this means that the focus on the power density is a focus on efficiency, and the fo and this route takes you to uh, the right technology and the right design in order to uh, help the supercharging to to happen. So uh, the target has to be to go down to five ten minutes. Uh, actually, I, I would say that after the uh, range anxiety that maybe we have contributed to with the Gen 2 car, mm. with, the, mm -hmm. with, the, um, with the battery, the next step is the supercharging, yeah. uh, sorry, it's the charging uh, anxiety because of course you don't want to wait for hours to, yeah. to, to travel around. Just adding on that, as the official sponsor of Formula E charging, <laughs> <laughs> Anel thoroughly buys into what you're saying there about the technology, delivering the energy faster, more efficiently, and making it very easy for the different consumers. But the other thing about Formula E, you asked, you know, how it can help, or not Formula E specifically, but motorsports specifically, generally, can support, is make it fun. We have to ha educate the world about how cool it is to drive electric. Uh, I've owned an EV for only three years, but man, I love it. Every day I get in the car, it's fast. It's completely quiet. I haven't been to the service station and forked out three grand or six grand when I used to own uh, an old M3 that I used to drive around. That was a lot of fun to drive. That'll cost you some But money, actually though. not as much fun as my EV. And I haven't forked out that kind of cash at the service station for years. People need to learn that this is actually today. EVs, electrification is today. The days of it only being for the top tier, you know, yeah. the high-end buyers yeah. with a limited range, it's, that's past, that's done. Yeah. So, but we have to educate. So motorsports and sort of the element of fun and education that come through that, I think is critical. Uh, and I really want us to see us collectively in the industry drive forward and how we can bring people along to the place that we know is inevitable. <laughs> Any thoughts on that, guys? Yeah, I think yeah, there's a lot of things going on. I think that the army of scientists, engineers so far, yeah, it's been very, very creative in order to really yeah, drive down the cost. We are very excited. We are very close to the price of the combustion engine vehicles. Yeah, the question is, is how you're going to develop a better materials chemistry in order that you can accommodate the, f the eventually that will happen, the fluctuation of the price of the raw materials, because recently the cobalt price went to the roof. So how the industry will accommodate this in order to keep going, the, you know, delivering the price of the battery in order to really uh, make this, this technology yeah, the first the first yeah, option and, and yeah, for the consumers in the end of the day, so yeah. I would just like to add, I, I see that exactly with our clients is mm -hmm. the primary focus once we've developed electrification, how to do a cost effectively for the broad market. Yeah. It's, the, it's the main thing we're talking about with all of our customers and really paints a super bright future for yeah. what we're doing. David, there's a lot of discussion about the, you know, the pure performance of the battery and how quickly you can charge it and how much energy it's got, all of that kind of stuff. But what opportunities are there with innovation around sort of the recycling of, uh, of batteries? <laughs> yeah, recycling is, is, is a vast area and it's going to be more complicated by the issue that Robson just raised with the price volatility of various yep. Uh, yep. Uh, commodities or raw materials because those raw, ma raw material price spikes will um, make it harder to come up with one standard or two standards as time changes. You have to have a proliferation of different sort of chemistries that will maybe uh, become dominant in certain time windows and, and, and over geographies. And that is going to complicate recycling. So, so recycling is, is from, from an opportunity perspective, it's the biggest opportunity we have. The flip side of that is the biggest challenge that we have because, you know, with multiple battery chemistries and recycling and, and, and trying to figure out how to do it, we're still at the research stages really in deciding, you know, how to treat, how to process, how to separate, how to dispose of lithium and the other, uh, 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 you know, inputs, material, active materials. So it's, uh, it, it's a big challenge. It's one that is being looked at by multiple labs around the world. And uh, there are examples of, of, of it happening so far, but the best uh, kind of existing 
uh, answer to that question is, is, is sort of cascading those batteries down to a lower power requirement without actually dissecting them or recycle, recycling, trying to recycle the materials, po deferring and postponing the actual physical disassembly of the battery for as long as you can until you have to. And yeah. then when we get to that stage, then it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of work. So, so that remains to be one of our biggest challenges, I think. Yeah, the, the recycling industry, metal recycling industry already exists um, yeah, for automotive catalysts mm. and also for the electronic waste. But if you look at this business, yeah, they are targeting very high value metals like gold, like platinum group metals. Yeah. So when you come to battery business, yeah, they, the price are not so attractive yeah. Yeah, as opposed to platinum and gold, but yeah, we have substantially much more metals that it's possible to recycle. Recycle, so yeah, there's quite a bit now. Yeah, some cobalt because the price went to the roof in the in the last years, but come down again. I don't know. We we'll see, but eventually this is the the industry that needs to be developed because otherwise we we can we cannot make yeah dig rolls all over the world in order to find metals and you because if this industry really becomes huge as we expect, yeah, yeah, the environmental impact will be will be great. I just want to say I'm really excited about what Preston said about aligning the transportation application and the stationary use and even doing it on the small scale. Mm. It seems very practical to me and cool and yeah. a way that you can actually improve the situation without worrying about the big dynamic or let that develop over time, let's say. So I think it's very yeah. exciting and interesting. Yeah. That's right. It's, it's not only recycle, but yeah. it's reuse. Yeah, it's so cool. you take those yeah, batteries and you put them in place uh, on site yeah. and we can shave off the demand, the peak demand that occurs with, for instance, EV charging mm -hmm. or the building consumption. Yeah. So bringing that in place, that helps reduce the cost of a building mm -hmm. or and charging. And then it basically is also uh, delaying that recycle process that we talk about that also has to be cost effective and environmentally friendly. And, and I think that's why you see the, the innovations in the charging, particularly the charge, the home charging is, is a very important area because the two places where people are going to park their car for the most part are going to be at work and at home, at work during the day and at home at night, and the draw on the, so we're going to uh, see some innovations, not only technologically, but also behaviorally and re from a regulatory point of view, to incentivize daytime charging so that we don't create a, a power draw at, at night when everybody comes home and parks their car in their garage, and maybe some tech smart charging applications to regulate the current, uh, the voltage requirements, the power requirements over time, to spread that and distribute it, so that we, we, we uh, don't exacerbate the problem of the duck curve, which already exists in the power distribution business. Interesting. That's fascinating stuff. Uh, Robson, what are the the technical limits on the development of, of better batteries, and what's the sort of blue sky thinking when it comes to batteries? Yeah, the limits I think in these days is we want safer batteries high power density, fast charging, high energy density, and everybody's looking for the perfect solution that brings all the, those things together in one single pack. So, and of course, yeah, the limitations yeah, yeah, that we have in terms, for example, in these days, yeah, the source of your raw materials, I'm gonna give you a specific example of cobalt mm. that comes from a very conflicted area in Africa, in the Congo. So when the industry is cutting down the amount of cobalt in order, and as they cut down the amount of cobalt, they increase the amount of nickel, which is the formulation chemistry of the cathode material, which is the very key uh, for, the, for, the, for, for the batteries. So, but as you increase the, the amount of nickel, yeah, the battery uh, starts to experience some instability. Yeah, it doesn't last as, as long as possible, and people are trying to look solutions in order to overcome this. But this type of, of, of developer, I would say, is more based on existing materials, that the chemistry that is still out there, and people try to, to change yeah, the, 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 the relative amount of different metals based on the price and based on the supplyability, and of course, in order to keep the same type of performance or even increase a little bit the performance of the materials. But when you think in terms of uh, quantum leap or blue think, sky thinking that you mentioned, yeah, you, you should go to other I would say automate type of material, which is the technical challenge is still very high. So there is a lot of yeah, thinking about in terms of pure lithium metal batteries, yeah, which is the highest energy density that is possible because you know we're using lithium as our energy carrier element. Yeah? 
Yeah, all the energy that comes in the battery comes from the lithium that we introduce in the structure of the materials that's there. So if you divide, design a lithium, pure lithium metal, you have 100% lithium metal is the highest energy density possible that you have. Um, and this is very challenging, yeah, which, because the mechanism of the, of the battery will be different. Yeah, there's a lot of work. And, and the other thing that also the industry is, term, in, in, is thinking, it's just a lot of money, it's a lot of develop. I just came back from a battery conference in San Diego two weeks ago. And when you think what the forward thinking, most of the scientists and even the startup companies in the Silicon Valley, they are all looking for all solid state batteries. And this will be very thin batteries with yeah, safe. Yeah, it will give you a lot of opportunities for you to miniaturize batteries and to cut down the volume. So for for vehicles designer, it will be very nice. Instead of having a heavy pack mm -hmm. underneath your vehicle, you have a much smaller and lighter type of, of battery. This is, I think, will be, at least in my view, the ultimate solution for the next 30 years. Yeah. And of course, there are all this technology that's coming that is, is, will be competitive with electrical vehicles. But in terms of batteries, I think the, the, the quantum leap will be all solid state batteries. I don't know if you're going to achieve it, but it's a challenge. Yeah, this is, will be the up. Uh, Preston, I know, uh, I know NLX has a vision for a new approach to electric power and empowering businesses and individuals. How does that fit into the, to the energy landscape? Sure. Actually, let me give sort of three examples of what we're seeing. So as mentioned earlier, we're going to see tens of millions of cars, electric cars, trucks, buses on the roads in the coming years. Utilities are ready to provide that energy. The question is, what's the mix of terms of renewables that are provided versus traditional generation? And also, what is the cost that that energy is going to be delivered at? We work have worked with a number of utilities for a variety, a number of years now, where, for instance, in Northern California, uh, we work with a company called Sonoma Clean Power, and Sonoma Clean Power has about 3,000 of our juice box charging stations installed in homes. And we did that in collaboration with them because they want to be able to manage when that charging occurs and to be able to optimize it. So it's very small shifts, usually, in terms of time, but it gives them that flexibility to understand where charging is happening and when uh, so that they can actually optimize it and provide incentives. Just finally, David, with these changes in energy infrastructure and everything, does that limit or support the global expansion of electric vehicle take up? Well, I, I think that right now, we're, we, we, when you're talking about limiting or supporting, I mean, you sort of what time frame are we talking about for electric vehicle adoption? So, uh, most data that we look at sees uh, uh, you know electric battery uh, representing roughly half of the cost of the EVs today and de decreasing down to about 18 to 20 percent by 2035, let's say. And uh, so that's the kind of a baseline uh, trend, trend that we see now. The the uh, the trend the, the the changes in the, the overall infrastructure are uh, potentially could impede that I would say because I think the people who are making those projections are actually quite optimistic about uh, uh, the problem with infrastructure is economics and return on investment the companies that invest in the infrastructure need to have it be profitable and it requires a lot of money so if it's not if you can't get investors behind it's not going to happen uh, so I would say if anything that could slow things down. And there's where it's going to uh, depend on maybe uh, some anchor players, as I described earlier, and Tesla has done a lot in, in this area, uh, to actually step out and, and, and make the investment um, in order for that to happen. Now, China, as we talked about, has actually taken a lead in, in that area and has made that, that kind of investment with the help of government funds. Um, we're more measured about that in the United States which is going to be a, um, it, it's, it's kind of the issue of the year, yeah. yeah. It's an interesting comment because you're right, we're not investing at the level that we could be. If we invest more, we're actually creating a lot of jobs. Mm -hmm. And I think that point gets missed quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, but when you begin to do the type of work we're talking about putting infrastructure in place, mm -hmm. you're opening up the opportunity for electricians, maintenance people, not to mention the folks who are actually designing equipment and manufacturing it. We manufacture our product in the USA, yeah. amazingly. 
Um, but that's jobs right there. So you add that together and it's very significant. So I think there's a huge opportunity for us to tap into. And I'd like to see that actually you know, emphasize more. Uh, and then we can offer the kind of innovation you know, that you're referring to. Um, even without incentives uh, from the government, we actually don't need them necessarily, but they certainly can help. They can accelerate. They can push things forward and get the infrastructure because we're building an entire new fueling system for these vehicles. And the economics are not always super great because utilization is still low today. Utilization will raise and economics will improve. So we're reliant at this point either upon at least some support and or we're looking for ways by which uh, it does make economic sense, which for many sites is not that they're gonna make money on the incremental cost of selling energy, but it's because they're bringing customers to their location uh, or they're retaining their employees by offering uh, a charging amenity. Uh, so when you go and you go to your shopping or you're gonna hang out, it's nice to have that sort of convenient charging there. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's an indirect benefit yeah. And what we want to do at Enel is we want to make that cost effective for people, but we also want to offer additional services where we can take off the hard work associated with doing that and make it very easy for people. Uh, because most companies aren't in the business of offering charging. They'd rather have somebody else provide that for them. Right, and if you go back and you remember when you, had, when you purchased a cell phone uh, 10 years ago, uh, many times you'd look at their coverage map of the carrier, you yeah. kind of determine whether or not that was adequate for you. So I think in a sense, we, and what you saw over time was the evolution of a variety of various hubs emerged with very dark spaces mm -hmm. where you can say there's good coverage around Minneapolis, there's good coverage around New York. And I, I think we're going to see a similar sort of analogous evolution within the charging industry. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's just going to, um, and, and, and the, coming back to motorsports and hubs, I think motorsports uh, are going to be very effective in helping to get some, um, some enthusiasm, some motivation, some energy, some intuitive feel for this, which yep. is going to motivate people to want to continue to, to go forward. And we talked about the adoption rate and much in terms of cost and, and uh, efficiency, but you know, ultimately what we're going to find is that people have purchased their electric vehicles um, you know, maybe now they purchase it out of a, a out of an analytic decision. You know, because it's saving, it's conserving, and it's saving. But like like you said, Preston, I mean, ultimately they're going to buy it because it's a better car and it's more fun. That's right. So, yeah. so I think the, the 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 sports and and the evolution of the hubs uh, of of charging networks kind of go hand in hand, yep. and they can help feed each other and and increase adoption rates. I don't know how much cell phones have actually gotten better in terms of their coverage range but vehicles are getting better in terms of the range. So that coverage map that you talk about actually gets larger every time you add a mile of range to the battery and to the car. So it makes the importance of the overall density mm -hmm. uh, a little bit less critical yeah. because the range is getting longer, if you understand what right, I'm saying. Right, right, and I think- So that's a nice benefit that we're getting from all the innovation that yeah. you, know, you folks are doing on the battery front and the people with the vehicles are driving yeah. in terms of increasing the efficiency and the range of the, of the vehicles themselves. The, the, the combination of supercharging and the extended range will somehow yeah. draw the map. That's that right, it, it makes the map more accessible but also picking up from uh, one of the, the, the latest comments, uh, of course the paradigm of the car is changing in the last uh, 30, 40 years from a, a way to, to be free, you know, taking the car and finally be dependent to a connectivity node and then it will become a, an energy node. Mm -hmm. It is already an energy mm -hmm. node. So the, mm -hmm. the actual network is, is also dynamic and moving and uh, you may exploit any uh, residual energy while people are at work and then making sure that they have the energy Mm -hmm. just to go back home. Right. So a, a, a lo data will still be the currency, I have to say. It uh, uh, will be uh, a key element of uh, the system to, be, to, to and, function. And we didn't even talk about ownership models and the yeah. shift <laughs> ah, to yeah. ride sharing ah, yeah. and sort of more you know, yeah, yeah. shared type yeah. solutions. That has an entire other that's impact another, with regards to how the vehicles are used, <laughs> yeah. what the communications, what the entertainment, what the services are that are offered, a whole other sort of topic I guess maybe we can do on the next panel. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we look forward to that panel. <laughs> Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank Fascinating you. stuff. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.